Hey guys, this is Steven Max here from Avid Max. Uh, we appreciate you tuning in to watching our winter fishing video with the guys from Flycast. Uh, we're here in the studio to talk to you a little bit more about the rigs that we were using, what we saw while we were out there, and uh, what was working. So, to kind of dive into the conditions that we saw, and then we'll go into our rigs. Max, you want to kick us off? Thanks, Steve. So I'm going to jump in uh, straight from rod uh, all the way to the end of the leader setup. Uh, so on that particular day, uh, I was fishing my 9 foot 5 weight Helios 3D. Um, my fly line I was using was a uh, Scientific Angler's uh, Amplitude Trout. Um, I overweight that rod with that line um, and it's just a matter of, you know, five grains. Um, so if I were to go with the MPX, uh, I believe it's like a 150. Um, and by oversizing it with the trout, it goes to like a 155 uh, grain weight. And so just adds a little bit more um, kind of feel to that rod. So that's kind of why I would do the six weight trout versus the MPX, which if you don't know the MPX is just a half a size heavy um, on my every single, you know, standard line weight. So going down from there, um, the bud section of my leader um, is going to be a saltwater fluorocarbon. I use the fluorocarbon because I feel like it definitely gets uh, a, a better drift, gets down a little bit quicker and tracks a little bit better in the water um, and just really cuts through the water uh, nicely uh, as opposed to like a mono or a nylon wood. Um, lengthwise on that, um, I typically like to have my indicator as close to the fly line as possible. Um, I'm sure some people would disagree with me, um, but I, I like that it it gives me the opportunity to see and track the fly's angle uh, where that drift is actually going. So when I have the indicator up high, you know, I don't have all that much actual, you know, butt section or this saltwater uh, fluorocarbon in the water. So anywhere from, you know, three feet to six feet, depending on, you know, scenario of which I'm fishing. Um, and then I'll go to a micro swivel. Um, and I like the micro swivel because it kind of allows things to swing freely, uh, adds a little bit of weight kind of in the middle of the rig. Um, and it's pretty discreet when you're, you know, um, talking about whether or not, or, you know, a swivel or a fish can see it. Um, so from a micro swivel, I'll go down to just straight fluorocarbon. Um, same thing kind of depends on scenario. I try and stay away from 6X while I'm fishing in the winter. Um, you know, you might fool a couple more fish, but I do catch a lot of fish, especially on high pressure tailwaters uh, that have flies hanging out of their mouth. Uh, and ethically, I just hate seeing that. Uh, so I stay away from the 6X, fish 5X all the way down to my bottom bugs. And, uh, you know, I might not fool as many fish, but I'm definitely gonna land those fish. Um, so going down from that fluorocarbon, um, I believe on that particular day I was fishing 4x down to my blood knot, uh, which with my blood knot, I leave one tag really long um, and then I tie an overhand knot in that tag um, and that's where I'll put my split shot. Um, it just helps the flies kind of come up off the bottom um, a little bit um, and it's not real long, you know, it's just maybe inch or two, kind of gives it a little bit more room um, and if you do hook up on bottom with the weight typically you can just break the weight off and then you know you're putting the tippet or you're putting the uh split shot above the uh the knot so kind of keeps you fishing a little bit longer without having to retie and redo everything uh from there i think i was going down to 5x and i finished 5x all the way through my rig i might have fished 5.5 trout hunter down to my last fly um, and there's there's not much different there but there's uh, some you know, good strength behind that 5.5 trout hunter. The distance between my flies, uh, I really mix up depending on what fly I'm fishing, the weight of the fly, um, size of the fly. So it really depends um, distance wise, but I'm always kind of in that 18 to 16 inches in between flies. Um, and tying eye to eye or bend to eye also depends on, um, you know, what what particular um, pattern I'm fishing, like a stone fly, for example. Um, I like to fish it from eye to bend. Um, as to where like a jig, I would probably go eye to eye. And that's just the, how it's gonna look in the water. You know, the stone fly is gonna come more directly at the fish and is not gonna be kinda, 
you know, moving sideways downstream. So that's kind of why I would pick to, you know, fish eye to eye versus eye to bend. Um, so a little food for thought there that I think definitely, you know, matters. Uh, weight of the fly is also another like touch point that um, I think is important when you're, you know, assessing how you're going to rig your setup. Um, I don't think in fishing in any facet there's, um, you know, an absolute, it always got to be adjusting and um, I think the best guides and, you know, best fishermen um, are always able to kind of adapt to the day. Um, so on that day in particular, you know, I feel like I could have fished 6x, maybe hooked a couple more fish. Um, would I have landed those fish? TBD. We'll never know. <laughs> All right, good stuff. Um, so in some of the footage, you'll see that I actually had two setups out there on the river. Um, I had one indicator set up with a nine and a half foot six weight uh, H3F, um, which I really like for kind of a big water um, nymphing ring because it's pretty supple. I have a lot of extra reach so I can do some easier mends and roll casts. Uh, but all the fish I caught that day were on the Euro rig, so that's what I'm going to focus on. Um, so let me show you the leader setup that I have. You'll see that it's uh, pretty thin. Um, it's kind of towards the thin or thinner leaders that you see out there as far as the Euro nymphing setups. So after my section of Maxima Chameleon is where I transition into my cider material. On other formulas, this might be uh, Amnesia, but I've gone direct to my cider. I've found that it doesn't affect my turnover at all, and uh, a lot of times, simple is better. So from my Chameleon, I'm going to anywhere from three to five feet of the Rio black and white bicolor cider in uh, 3X. And I found that this black and white, that checkerboard kind of breakup, it really pops against natural surroundings. And depending on the lighting, you'll really see one color or the other um, that'll help you kind of follow that down to the next section of cider, which is 4X Scientific Angler's Tricolor. Now with each color change, I'm gonna go ahead and make a cut there and then do a blood knot, leaving about a half inch to one inch tag of each color. Once again, this kind of helps with visibility. This goes down to your two mil or trout size tippet ring. Overall, this leader is uh, pretty versatile. It's light and long, um, turns over well, and uh, very sensitive for you. Another thing you'll notice is the way that I was fighting fish with that setup is uh, pretty low rod angle, trying to keep their heads down and turn them uh, by using, you know, the the rod as a, you know, a lever and getting that uh, pull against the main mass of the fish. Um, and then the way that I try to land fish is get beneath them and then get them to roll over and work back to me. So uh, by doing that and keeping a lot of pressure and keeping a, uh, a low rod angle, that's how I land a lot of fish on that lighter tippet. Not saying that I land every single fish that I hook on 6X, uh, but you can definitely practice that aspect of your fly fishing game. You know, people practice their casts, people work on tying different patterns, uh, but fighting fish is kind of the whole deal. So if you can work on that and get better at that, um, you can have some pretty good days out there uh, making the most of the fish that you do hook and converting that into fish in the net. So, totally, and that softer rod, you know, is definitely uh, the point that I'm kind of making with the 6X. Um, light rod, you know, with a lot of suppleness in the tip and, you know, a lot of bend all the way down to the butt section is going to be a lot more forgiving than the very stiff Helios 3 that I was mm -hmm. fishing. Um, even the F, you know, is a better option kind of yeah. for what we were doing, um, just because that tip is so much softer. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, given, and also the hook setting, like giving it some more juice. Yeah. Uh, when you're actually going to hook set, um, I think is something like with the stiff rod that I was fishing, pretty much just have to lift the tip and there's already enough pressure there to like get a pretty decent hook set. Mm -hmm. uh, with you, I know you have to... I mean, on a Euro stick, you got to give it a little bit of juice to actually yeah. embed that fly. So Yeah, and there's a, there's some nerdy things too that I do when I build my leaders um, that allows me to get away with a little bit of the Bassmaster Classic. I actually boil some of my leaders and uh, I've done tests where I've stood in my living room and tied it off to a table, grabbed the other end and got to where it was taut and I was able to walk back like 
three to five feet of just stretch. So I know what the capabilities right. of my gear are. Right. Um, so I do those tests in home so that when I'm on the water, I, I know what I can get away with. Um, so the rig itself, um, you know, we've shown you kind of my, my leader setup. So below that tippet ring, um, all this is depending on what I'm seeing on the water and water depth and current speed and stuff like that. On uh, the day that we were out there fishing, um, little bump and flows, you know, there's some deeper buckets and troughs, but um, nothing super crazy. So I didn't have to go too, too long to my first fly. Um, and with the setup that I have in the diagram, you can see that, you know, with that dropper tag and a point fly, you can easily fish this um, with as many flies as you want. If you want to get really technical and just have one fly and really manage where the current seam that you're fishing is, you can do that. Um, but on more glidey kind of wintering pools, you can get away with three flies. So that's what I was doing. Um, where I have my heaviest fly is pretty dependent on water type and what, what I think the fish are doing. So if I see some bug activity and I suspect fish are more spread out throughout the water column, what I'll do is I'll put my heaviest fly on the bottom, which makes everything ride a little more vertical. And I can do one or even two tags of lighter bugs above that. And they're kind of flowing and emerging. And the massacre mage is really good for that. If I suspect fish are more concentrated on that bottom piece of the water column, I'll put my heaviest fly as the first fly in my rig and then one or even two flies behind that. Um, so that makes it so that everything rides a little more horizontal. So I'm tight to that first fly and then my smaller, more natural bugs are behind that. So on that day, uh, my heavy fly was a cream or tan colored mop. That's kind of my go-to uh, in the winter time when I'm trying to fish smaller bugs in tandem with it. It's really heavy. It's kind of works as like a, a parachute slowing the whole rig down, getting the whole rig deep. Um, and it gives me good contact to those smaller flies. So like I said, I kind of switch up where that's at depending on where the fish are at. I like to do one up, one down. It kind of gives me both benefits. So if I fish that mop fly as the second tag, one smaller bug above that, and then one smaller bug on the point below that, I'm kind of really covering my bases um, as far as what I'm presenting to the fish. All of my fish that day did come on the cream colored mop fly, and it just goes to show that um, there's a little more to it than it just being a big, ugly, heavy thing. It actually can look quite like a crane fly on a lot of the tailwaters that we have here in Colorado. Um, and just that material, when it does get waterlogged, it almost takes on this kind of neutrally buoyant consistency where once it gets down to that uh, feeding buffer zone, kind of that slow water above the substrate of the river, it kind of really allows everything to kind of flow. And, you know, we're talking about micro seams or micro drag here, but allowing some level of movement to your flies um, is good. You don't want your Euro rig to be so heavy that you're just like holding a puppet and it's just moving perfectly level through the water column. You want some bit of uh, movement there. So, totally. and with that bigger fly, uh, it allows you to not have to fish just a jig style fly mm -hmm. with your other fly. So when you have a heavy anchor like that, like your mop fly, you know, you don't have to fish that heavier tungsten bead. You know, Absolutely. You fish something lighter right. um, and have a little bit more opportunity there. Yep. Yeah. So um, some people think that maybe you couldn't your own inch in the winter time because how are you going to get a slide of tungsten bead onto something when there's, you know, 20s, 22s, 24s and, and up kind of as far as the naturals. Um, well, if I fish that one big heavy bomb mop fly, right. I could tie on any one of those midges and that's exactly what I did that day. Um, so something like a massacre midge up top, like I said, that little piece of foam really helps it kind of move up through the water column once it gets to depth. Any of your classic wintertime small stuff, Black Beauty, Zebra Midge, uh, an RS3, RS2s, anything like that. There's a lot that you can do. Um, it's a very versatile setup. So that about covers it for uh, the rigs that Max and I use. Um, there's obviously many variations of what we're talking about. It's not the one rig to rule them all. The point here is there's a lot of different ways to kind of achieve the same thing, um, but it's very situational. There's some personal preference involved. And I think the key is that um, all these setups are pretty modular. You can vary them um, and really tailor it to exactly what you're doing. And I think that's probably the biggest piece of all this is that you have to be willing to make the change, whether that's the depth, the weight, the flies, you know, the water type that you're searching for, your approach to the river. So being willing to make to making that change is kind of, you know, uh, a overlooked factor. Sometimes you try to force what you're using on a certain water type when you really know in the back of your head, maybe I should switch this out to 
uh, a different line, a different fly, you know, add a split shot, take a split shot off. So um, that's pretty much what we're driving at here. And uh, to kind of show you two other options as far as winter fishing goes, we'll have uh, Travis and Taylor from Flycast show you what they've got. Thanks guys, I'm Taylor with Flycast and this is Travis. We're here today to talk you through some of the, uh, the fundamentals that we saw on the water. You know, what flows we're doing, what we were seeing water temperature wise and you know, how that translates to our fishing tactics and also you know, ultimately what we were using as far as our, our rig. Um, so in just the last couple of days before we hit the water, flows had actually bumped. Um, and at the time there were something like 140 CFS, which you know, compared to historical averages, that was about 100 CFS above normal. So this was actually a really good uh, flow for us to be fishing. You know, generally it's it's really, really low. Trout are extra spooky. They're holding in those deep runs and really potting up. Uh, in this case, they had a little bit of a chance to spread out. Um, you know, for the most part, they were holding in that deeper water, but you know, they were able to move out into the, into the faster stuff in the afternoon. So. In the, in the morning, you know, it started out slow. You know, it's winter, water temperatures are low. So, you know, trout are lethargic. They're in conservation mode. So at, at this point, it was, it was really tough to, to land fish. But, you know, as the day went on, water temperatures rose. Trout started getting more active with new bug life in the water. This is when we, we really started to, to start seeing some results. And, you know, I personally was starting out with something bigger. You know, these flies or these trout see these micro uh, midges day in and day out. And so I threw a Myers mini leech or an egg sucking leech. Um, either way, um, it uh, it turned a few heads and, and got some attention. And I, and I went with the scud as well. When we saw those flows bump, we knew it was gonna be spitting out um, scuds from the reservoir as well as picking up those bigger bugs from the bottom of the river. So we definitely both led with something large to get their attention, whether they ate it or just got their attention. Um, both worked and then as Taylor mentioned it did warm up in the afternoon which is great and we did see some midges flying around no surface activity but uh, we were both able to trail our rig with um, uh, midge pupa patterns I, I did a flashback mercury black beauty and it brought a few fish into the net so paying, in, paying attention to a few of those things definitely helped and paid off in the long run um, as far as our rigs went that day you know Taylor and I actually fished pretty similar setups um, I was working with a G Loomis NRX Plus that day, nine foot five weight, and Taylor was on a Mystic nine foot five Reaper X. Um, the NRX is probably a little stiff for that water, to be fair, it was, it was a new rod for me, so had to give it a try anyways, but it fared just fine on the setup. Um, in the winter, Taylor and I really like to be stealthy with our approach as well as our setup. And that means light tip at long leader and yarn indicators. We're a big fan of that, even though Flows were up high around 140 CFS. The water was still really clear. Trout are skittish. And so minimizing that impact and the service on the, on the water is something that we always aim to do. And so um, we both run an MPX line um, down to a monocarbon uh, leader. Uh, don't really see much use in using fluoro on the leader personally. You know, the, tr the flies are attached to the fluoro, so that's really what they're looking at. We use the mono, just extra strength. It's a little bit cheaper, easier on your budget. Um, and so we run a nine foot to 10 foot mono leader from our MPX 5.5 line. From there, um, we apply some tip, uh, split shot. So the split shot, we usually go heavy with it. Uh, we want to get our flies down quick in our drift. You know, if, if we notice that we're hooking fish at the tail end of the drift or we're snagging the bottom at the tail end, it's a good sign for us to add more. So we want our, fl our flies to get down quickly and we use split shot to do that. Uh, from there, we brought it down to 5X fluorocarbon tippet from um, Rio and then start with our tractor pattern. For him, it was a leech. For me, it was a scud. And then from there, we start working with 6X with the super high high water clarity. We wanted to be as stealthy as possible and fool these trout. So we run eight to 12 inches of fluoro down to um, a midge larva typically. Um, midge larva in size 22 
typically, and then trail another eight to 10 inches of 6X below that to a midge pupa. That way we're covering both life cycles in that rig, as well as having a nice attractor. Um, as far as our indicator goes, like I said, we like yarn. Um, we typically do it one and a half to one times the water depth. And so, you know, when we're doing it heavy with heavy weight, um, I'll typically favor one, just the, the straight depth, one times depth. And that just gets a good clean drift. I don't like my flies dragging behind or anything like that. It just helps keep better contact on those flies. That's a really good point on the, uh, the indicator, especially in the winter. Like it's it's super important to make sure your flies get down. We talked about using, you know, arguably more weight than you would normally use. But you can also go with a little bit shorter indicator, like Trav was saying. Initially, he said, you know, one and a half times the depth of water, but in the winter, you know, it's closer to one. So just things to keep in mind, you know, you're constantly changing, you're constantly adapting to the environment, the, the specific hole you're in. Uh, a good buddy of ours, he's he's well-versed with the South Platte, and he'll tell you that's a two split shot hole, that's a single split shot hole, adjust your indicator to here. So, you know, you're constantly just adapting and you know while you might cycle through a bunch of flies don't forget to adjust your weight like that's one of the biggest things that we've found that leads to success for us on the water if you're not getting hung up on the water from time to time you're you're arguably not deep enough and you know it sucks to get hung up and bring your flies in and take off all the the grass and the weeds and, and whatnot from your flies but you know one of the things you'll notice in this video is you know there's some tricks to to get past that and i don't know what it's called specifically but if you if you just kind of whip your flies around uh, and slap the water do this in an area that you're not fishing obviously or where you see trout holding but you can get 90 95 percent of that gunk off your flies and just keep fishing and, and keep your hands warm keeping your hands warm is huge yeah um, and then one other thing i'll just say about weight you know you talked about adjusting your weight and depth when you move into different sections deeper shallower faster um, the other thing is time of day so um, when we start out in the morning it was cold heavy heavy weight we we're in that that deepest water column there towards towards the end of the day when we saw midges coming off the water actually took off some weight to get um, our, our flies drift into that middle column there where the trout are suspended and feeding in the water. So a lot of things to, to take into account, but if you're paying attention and observing what's going on and experimenting, it usually pays off quite a bit. Um, as far as casting styles go, um, in the winter, you know, Taylor and I are huge, you know, overhand casters. We love whipping dries 30, 60 yards in the summer, but in the winter, we try to get away from that a little bit. We're never able to, especially if we're trying to hit a seam that's a little bit further away. So we will overhead cast, obviously trying to minimize that because the more you do that, um, the easier it is to spook trout. They see that movement overhead. So um, whenever possible, we try to do the roll cast. Um, just real simple and effective, minimizing the amount of times you're hitting the water, um, get your flies back in quickly. Yeah, and, and with that, you know, you you see trout holding, the, the water clarity is generally high in the winter. So everything you can do to spot fish before you cast is gonna put you at better odds. But, you know, the way you work the hole is also just as important. You know, you might be mi missing fish that are sitting closer to you or further from you, and you don't wanna necessarily go straight for that trout right away. Give it a couple of casts closer in, say you're standing, you know, on the, a couple feet from this side of the bank and you're fishing this way, like kind of work your way in and just slowly roll cast uh, while sight fishing and just kind of meticulously pick apart that water um, until you move on. Yeah. I just realized I said 30, 60 yards. That's absurd. That's 30. <laughs> That's impressive. 30 to, yeah, I <laughs> wish. Um, 30 to 60 feet. I'm entering a yeah. distance competition here in the summer. All right, so at this point, you know, we've covered a lot in, you know, in a lot of ways it can be a little intimidating, but here we have a ton of good information to help us have, you know, the most productive day on the water. So with that, we can't thank you enough for, for joining us and tuning into our winter fishing video. Uh, we look forward to 
putting out more here in the future. I know we got another one coming up here soon. Yeah, I think we're planning on doing a, a spring runoff video. You know, tactics are changing again, and we'll continue this uh, awesome relationship with Avimax and putting out updates and videos to, to help you guys progress as anglers throughout the year. Um, if you're looking to, to gear up or stock up on the winter essentials, head over to avimax.com. They have a ton of gear. Um, thanks again for following. Look forward to chat chat with you guys in a few months.